And welcome to this morning's panel. You receive a letter and get involved. I'm Heather Miller, moderator for this panel. Before our panelists introduce themselves, I'd like to thank the good friends of Jackson Elias for hosting this weekend with good friends on their Discord server. Interested listeners can find more information at blasphemoustomes.com. Our panel's topic is plot hooks, how to use enticing plot hooks, how to craft compelling and meaningful reasons for players to get involved, how to spark and maintain player interest, and how to set the stage for your scenario. And now our panelists. Uh, let's begin with Scott. Please introduce yourself. Uh, yes, hello. I'm Scott Dolwood. I am one of the good friends of Jackson Lies, one of the hosts of the podcast. I also appear on a number of uh, actual play podcasts, including Ain't Slayed Nobody, How We Rolled, and Grizzly Peaks Radio. I've written a bunch of stuff for Call of Cthulhu and other horror games. And I have opinions. Uh, and you can find more about me at the uh, the hitherto mentioned uh, or aforementioned um, blasphemoustomes.com. And Graham. Hello, I'm Graham Patrick. I've written several scenarios and I write for It's Laid Nobody and it's suddenly like appear there as well. And uh, I've written some audio dramas on top of that too. I run RPG Nook, where I rip apart scenarios and break them down to better understand how they actually tick. And Sue? Hi, I'm Sue Savage. I write scenarios for quite a wide variety of game systems. Uh, I also wrote my own game, Matrons of Mystery, which is a cosy mystery RPG. Uh, you can find the things I've written on Drive Through RPG uh, under a uh, search for my name, Sue Savage. And you can find me on various socials under the name Savage Spiel. And Chad. Hi, I'm Chad. Pronouns he, him. Uh, I'm a writer and journalist based in New York City. I currently work for a press freedom organization. Uh, I was co-host of the Miskatonic University podcast for eight years as Keeper Chad. I write as Charles Gerard, and I have published work with uh, Sentinel Hill Press, Cubicle 7, Golden Goblin Press, Darker Hue Studios, and Onyx Path. And I start, started playing role-playing games in the 1980s, and I can be found here or on the MUP Discord or on the Symphony Discord, sometimes streaming in games. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, this panel is advice for GMs who want to learn more about developing plot hooks. GMs of any level of experience are welcome here. We hope the advice and knowledge shared here will help you keep your players motivated, engaged, curious, and involved. So first question for the panel, uh, plot hooks not only spark player interest, but also maintain it. How do you see that process working in a scenario? Um, I'll toss this one to Chad and Graham. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chad, do you want to start, or do you want me to, to kick off? I, yeah, m I mean, my first thought is uh, that it's good to get weird fast. That mm -hmm. uh, there's no need to bury or suppress the strangest parts of your scenario until later, until second act, because that is really what people are at the table for. So let them know that there's going to be uh, mystery, even if it's just foreshadowing, some mysterious bits, some things happening to them, um, descriptions, but definitely get in there and um, and let them know it's not just a, a murder mystery. Um, that's a way to to keep people's interest, I think, after you know the initial body is found to have show some evidence or have uh, NPCs watching from the shadows or something like that to um, to pique interest. Yeah, that sounds good. I think it, it depends on what you want your scenario to be. Uh, that is valid, doing that jump in. The media res thing. I've actually, I've, I've been had some, some kickback about media res, like why are these people in this situation sort of thing. And there's a lot of backstory you need to tell if you jump in that fast, that far. Uh, to the story sometimes people want that slow burn so they want the the sort of plot hook to to actually have that sort of like cold case feel to it but it depends on what scenario you write for i know scott is very keen on the personal um sort of being 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 the story rather than actually following the story uh sort of thing but it, the, the plot hook i see is like you need to have like 
small little engines within the scenario to keep it going. So you've got one plot hook, which will lead to another plot hook, which will lead to another one. You build up and collect these these small nuggets of drivers um, that will keep you moving forward. And eventually at the end, the, the player should be so invested, there's no way they're, they're going to go back. They're, they're too heavily invested in the, the actual plots for them to step out of it. Uh, that's probably the, the ideal solution uh, to us to actually getting a player involved and invested. But the, the player themselves have to meet you halfway as well. They, you you can't force people to do what they don't want to do. Um, but yeah, getting weird fast and really slamming them in the face with it uh, usually wakes them up and really makes them pay attention. <laughs> yeah, if anybody else wants to jump in on these stats, please go ahead and do so. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, yeah, I, I, I agree with all of that. Uh, I mean, there is no one-size-fits-all solution. I, I think there are multiple approaches and they're all valid. The one thing that I'd say is common between all of them, however, is that, I mean, particularly for a one-shot, I mean, this perhaps applies less to a campaign, but for a one-shot, generally by the time the opening scene is over i'd like the players to have some idea of what it is they're being expected to do um i mean not just the characters but the players that there is some problem that they need to overcome there is some threat that they're encountering and i mean they i'm not saying that they need to understand the resolution to the mystery or what's really going on or whatever but they've got to have something they can sink their teeth into some problem they can look at and say oh yeah right we need to deal with that now yeah and goal, yeah, uh, yeah 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 and as long as you've got that and as long as the players buy into it it's going to work but uh, some of the the worst scenarios i played are where you know you get to the end of that opening scene and sort of oh okay well, what, what do i do now and why do i care about it so what are some what do you think are some good details or good ways to make that hook any given plot hook feel personal and important to the PCs. This is especially true about maybe campaign scenarios or a scenario that, that you're going to pass on to others, that you're not going to be there to know the players and know the people involved and how to, because we could all plot hook our friends in, right? But what about people you don't know? I think your friends are harder to hook in because they're more likely to rebel against you. I think that's, that's the one thing true. Really, Graham, tell us more about this. <laughs> this is becoming a, a, a session. Um, yeah, it's like they, they tend to like breaking things more and they'll, they'll step out of the scenario more. It's like it, scenarios that point off the map, basically, are, are, are a real bane of my existence. Uh, I've come across a few of them. And like you'll get a, like some sort of nugget of information, like, oh, this started in Africa. We're going to Africa, guys. And then they'll, they'll want to... <laughs> take that all yeah. away from where you're going so you got to be careful with that for sure but um to compel and to keep them in in the actual sandbox themselves uh personal investment something i'm i'm trying to kind of grapple with is something um i'm trying to call like universal tragedy something that will group them together and gel them together and there's very few scenarios that kind of do that um and you need that sort of like um joint uh sort of like motivation to 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 emotionally pushing forward i think yeah, i think the game system you're writing it for can be really useful yeah mm. uh, i'm thinking of something like delta green where it is literally your job and so that yeah. is yeah. inevitably going to drive the players forward because yeah they're, they're doing this for a reason and but when is the job not worth the the, the sort of like outcome of you dying basically that's the the thing yeah and also and also i say a job is kind of the opposite in some ways of uh person involvement they're both absolutely mm -hmm. compelling and good reasons to get involved but have Staying you know being involved. told to investigate something is different than having a person investment and the person investment side of it the two tricks that i use that i, I i'd advocate and they're not going to work for everyone one is uh, and this is something that you're not always going to have the luxury to do is to tailor the characters to the scenario um yeah. I, if they that either involves using pre-gens which tends to work best for convention scenarios or 
giving enough of the background uh, with uh, to the players that they can come up with characters with a bit of backstory and then you maybe take those backstory elements and hook them into the but the, the, the scenario and sort of say, oh, hang on, yeah, they, they've talked about their, their difficult relationship with their brother. What if I replace this character in the scenario with the brother? And then suddenly you've got that person investment. I, and and the, the other trick, which I think is a very simple one and probably come back to a number of times in this, is just simply asking the players to come up with a reason why they care. Yeah, don't don't be afraid to do that. It's not the GM's responsibility. The player, you know, the player has got to try to find some reason why their character cares about all this stuff. And I, I've certainly played with people who perversely seem to want to fight against that at every stage. And you know, if if that's your inclination, you're probably playing the wrong game. Yeah. Yeah, and that's yeah, there's more games out there that are going to make you happy if that's what you're fighting. <laughs> if it's sort of the core of role playing is what you're fighting while you're role playing, then yeah, yeah. And so you can ask the players to do it, even if you are writing pre-gen characters, because the characters I wrote for when I'm running mm. Scots Unland, uh, most of it is pre-written. But uh, I always ask the players, uh, this missing person, Steve, uh, who is he to you? Why is he so important? Yeah, that's the one I've exactly. Been as well. So it's a great scenario. Yeah. It's like it's got that universal tragedy to it because you've got that missing person you have to hook into. There's a reason you need to go to the park, and anyone can have that reason. So it's like uh, another one's uh, reading is uh, Jolene. Um, there's like oh, yeah. a, a, a loved one that's gone missing, and you have to basically go into that uh, mystery with that predestined sort of universal tragedy about your character. So I think one of the solutions is that when you get that sort of like, why are the players involved? You should really be writing down, like, well, if you want the character to be a, have a personal investment, here's a couple of things they should uh, be touching in their backstory or like that sort of thing. I think if you have a like a published scenario with that, the players would be more inclined, or at least the keepers would be more inclined to tell the players to have that, and you'd have that personal investment on a, a more universal level. Yeah, I think a technique that's sort of between the published scenario where you have no idea who the characters are and and being the GM is to ask leading questions. And you can um, ask those questions in the writing. You can say, ask the players uh, about their, their uh, most recent memory of the deceased or you know something to get as specific as possible to give a toolbox for the GMs. And the GM's job is to then find the specificities in the characters and their motivations. And and I think it's great to draw it out of players at the table. Yeah. yeah. Asking pre, pre-existing questions to the players, I think, helps them make... Uh, this all mostly comes down to make better bloody PCs uh, for your games. <laughs> I think uh, that's one of the biggest problems, communicating that between the player yeah. and the, the, the GM. Yeah, but so, also... Uh, oh, go, go ahead. Oh, sorry, but, but but also that thing of tailoring the um, a pre-written scenario and the hooks of it to the the characters. I I think that's something that when you're a a, a beginning GM or in your early days of GMing, I I mean I'm speaking from my own personal experience here, and this may not be the case with a lot of GMs now because game has changed a lot since the early '80s, but. Um, when I, I used to feel that when I was given a scenario and there were the hooks in there, and, and honestly, a lot of the hooks in the early Call of Cthulhu scenarios were pretty terrible, uh, that yeah, this, this was how I had to play the scenario, because this is what's written, this is what I bought, and so this is what I, I, I have to run. And you know, the idea of, of swapping out NPCs and stuff like that probably wouldn't have occurred to me then. But yeah, it's it's that confidence thing, and I think you just have to remember that no one needs to give you permission to change these things. You've 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 bought the scenario, you've you know, you've you've you know, you've downloaded it, and yeah, it's it's yours now. Do with it as you please, and if that involves changing all the NPCs, changing the opening hook, whatever, yeah, do it. So that's a good point about published scenarios. Um, so it. it what what do you see as the difficulty? So you, you know, you've got the your group, and then you've got maybe a larger group at a con that's a one shot, and now you've got a published scenario. Um, how do do those difficulties change? 
Um, yeah. If so, how? In what way? Well, you have to basically cater for a wider audience. The wider your audience, it's, it's, it's a Hollywood problem, actually, if you think about it. How, mm. how diverse do you want your audience to be? How niche do you want your audience to be? Uh, if you want a, a diverse, huge, wide audience, like you're appealing, appealing to everyone, that sort of classic thing, you shouldn't try to appeal to everyone. But uh, you kind of have to because that gives you the broadest way into the scenario. So someone might bring like Stanley Ace along to the game. Um, it was a pre-gen from uh, Doors of Darkness. They might just want to use that character, the like that character, so they bring it and try to shove it into your scenario. And they should be allowed to do that. That's what they want uh, to do. Um, mm. So you have to like cater to that. Um, so scenarios need to be wider uh, if you want to publish them, I think. Yeah, I think in the in, in the investigator, getting investigators involved block that you can provide very quickly just a bunch of options and, and try to provide ones that the, the GM might not have thought about that, you know, because you know the world of your scenario, the setting uh, maybe a little bit better just to drop some names of families that they might be involved in that are in the scenario or, um, you know, provide a toolbox again of different different inroads you might have the higher you might have this is your job or you've been asked to do this you know look into somebody's background on behalf of the, the a family or something like that but then provide lots of other extra kind of personal hooks to um do that work at the table all right so uh, let's Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, sorry. Uh, yeah. Well, um, oh, damn, I had something there. Just gone down. Uh, oh, yeah. No, no. I, uh, yeah. Well, I think there is a a deep fundamental problem, however, with generic hooks, which is they become trite very quickly. Oh, yeah. And there's a reason why this panel is called, you know, you receive a letter, because we've all played those classic Call of Cthulhu, Cthulhu scenarios where it's, you know, you receive a letter from your Uncle Oswald that starts with, I'm probably dead by now, but, and, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> and, and you, you have to pick it up there. Or the, the one that I've encountered in too many convention scenarios, which is, you know, Lord Arthur Generic has called all of you together into his drawing room. Uh, you know, none of you know each other, and he is sort of he's called in his manservant, his lawyer, his haberdasher, and so on. And is well, clearly, I personally can't get involved with this, but you now must, you strangers who are completely unsuited to this task, must now gather together yeah. in my name and fight evil. And it's so, oh, for <laughs> fuck's sake. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a huge problem with it, and that's why you, you can only need that something to tell them to it a bit more. Uh, I think being on the cold case and following the trail of something that's happened before you is, is fine, but along the way you need to give them the personal reason to to stay in it, uh, because eventually they'll hit that big gribbly that will just go, nope, I'm out of here, and uh, yeah. it's going to be hard for them to to go into the house basically where they know that thing is. Right. Uh, any last thoughts on this before we move on to the next next question? We can always come back to it or bring it up again if you want. Mm. So let's turn to a question about methodology. Uh, how do plot hooks instead become plot snares? Uh, so what do you see as maybe proactive versus reactive plot hooks and plot drivers? I, I guess I'll start this one because that's my question. I could go <laughs> <laughs> several. Uh, basically, basically, a lot of scenarios will come around and say, well, you're trapped in this area. Screw you. You're going to have to deal with this no matter what. And you just hear the screaming from this empty room where they, they're trapped and there's no way out. and You have to deal with it. It's basically um, what tends to happen is it becomes like a, a generation game conveyor belt of horror that you just have to sit through. Uh, watching all these things go past and uh, yeah it's like okay next one next one you're just rolling sanity <laughs> as you go through this house it's like oh okay so instead of just having that generic um, house of horrors that they have to just endure um, you need to have that proactive hook again for them to stay in the investment for them to push through it and engage with it 
uh, and interactivity is something which um, does that a lot, uh, rather than just like you see evil, you see evil, and how do you feel about that sort of thing. Um, there's a, a huge disconnect there, like pushing from one to the other. Hmm. I, I I think I kind of disagree with you there, Graham. Yeah. In that, um, I I don't think the problem with the situation you've described there, at least not from my perspective is the hook, the, the the trapping them in that situation. I think it's what you do with that situation afterwards that if it is, yeah, like you say, that conveyor belt of horror, that becomes numbing pretty quickly. But if you trap... Um, if you trap the characters in an interesting situation where there is dynamic stuff they can do, you know, things they can interact with in a meaningful way that will will escalate the situation and give them more, you know, chances for for role playing for investigation and to try to work out what's going on and get the hell out of it, then I I, th I think that's okay. Um, it's not something I do very often, but um, I mean, mild spoiler. I, there's a scenario published a little while back in the blasphemous term called night bus which yeah. is very much that you, you you're, you're trapped in this this situation uh following an accident and have to try to get your way out and i very deliberately once you're in the trap situation sort of set it up as a sandbox with npc interactions and weird shit going on uh, just to try to make sure that what happened after that was as dynamic as possible uh, and gave the the characters lots of choices, and I, I'd like to think that that mitigates the feeling of being trapped. Because you know, if you're trapped somewhere fun, then yeah, uh, you're not trapped it, at all. It should, but, yeah, but that was that was kind of my point though. This like you need to have that interactivity to yeah. make sure you don't feel trapped. It's like the one I always yeah. go to is is the dare. I, I'm gonna sorry, I was gonna harp on this a little bit it's like when you're in the dare you, you you've got this great high concept idea of these kids have to go into this haunted house and everyone loves that idea everyone's been there to the nostalgia of the 80s it's just everyone loves that and, and then basically they get locked inside and no matter how hard they try they cannot get out and it just becomes player versus gm like ag agitation almost between the two you can't get out of this window why because that's it's <laughs> yeah. not a good answer basically yeah, I've run the yeah. dare, uh, ran it yeah. on Halloween for a group of eleven players. Wow, that's a yeah. lot. Oh that, lord, yeah. that was that was a mess. Why? <laughs> they all yeah, totally not online. They, uh, yeah. they, some of them were online. No, they were all online. They were all online. Oh uh, my god! Them, everyone wanted to play, and it was a one shot. That was the only reason I agree because it was a one shot. But yeah, eleven players playing eleven year olds, and you know teenagers. <laughs> yeah. Oh god, that that's a whole different kind of horror. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> GM horror. Meta, meta horror. Yes. Uh. So, uh, so you talked a bit about, you know, what do you do to ensure your group is staying in a situation you've constructed in, in terms of this locked room scenario, kind of that we're or the reverse, maybe of a locked room scenario that we're talking about, but what other ways, how, what other ways maybe can you help and GMs help keep their players engaged with these plot hooks that you're putting out? You talked about making them personal. Are there any other ways you can think of? Well, as as you were talking about the sort of locked room and the thing that happens to you, I thought one thing you can always do is to try to make it ethically weird or difficult to do nothing. <laughs> you know that mm, that is yeah. that is a compelling situation because if the if the characters are if the players are imagining their characters internal lives uh then you know if the boat is sinking that's the the super compelling thing that it's it's weird to lock yourself in the in a you know in the bathroom in fact like you know self-destructive um but also if you have a personal connection and you um you know if, and you are told in some way that uh you are the right person for the job um that's another way to make it ethically sticky to get out of um yeah Yeah, I mean, along those lines, I mean, definitely stakes. As long as the the players understand what is at stake and they care about it, then that's it. And 
Yeah, it, it can be an existential threat facing them. It can be an existential threat facing people they could care about, facing the world, facing their local community. But as long as they, un you know, they understand this is the problem and this is what happens if I do nothing. But they, I mean, doing nothing is always an option. They can just sit back and watch the world burn. I have had players do that in which case yeah you you can narrate the world burning around them <laughs> but um yeah it's it, it, it fundamentally is it's up to them to decide that as long as they understand what's going on you know how, how they're going to engage with it that's one thing that i think monster of the week does well because it encourages you to write a, a countdown of it starts off with the the initial incident and then progresses through various stages of what happens if the players do nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can decide at what point the players are joining in the scenario, and that's the point where you write the hook. <laughs> so what happens oh, when nice. they do nothing? Uh, would you well, say in, in the last one I wrote, it, it would be that the, the entire world gets absorbed into a haunted house. Oh, okay. Ooh. Mm. Do you play that? Actually, that's just... kind of fun. Yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to see that out. happen. To be yeah, fair, so I want to see that. What were the stakes again, exactly? Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to assist. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's interesting. I mean, what do you do if you've got uh, if you've got players who turn out, or maybe a, a faction of the piece, the players at the table who end up wanting to assist what they are supposed to be fighting, or ostensibly oh. have bought in to fight. I mean, even <laughs> mechanically, that can happen, right? You can you can flip a oh, character yeah. based on us, based on the player's imagination, or on mechanically the loss of sanity, or or something else like that. Like or a bargain. I love I love when an NPC offers a bargain, yeah. <laughs> and the player takes it. Why not? I don't see I don't see any reason to stop that. <laughs> Well, the, the clear-cut yeah. answer of if you have like something which is like you, there's clearly only one answer or one solution to it, that's a, that's not a great idea to have for you. Always want that sort of moral dilemma at the end, so you kind mm. of want people to, to to have that sort of struggle. But I, I'd say a lot of it depends on the group you're running it for, and if you're going to play a game like that and run a game like that for strangers at a convention, for example, I always think it's worth putting out content warning that there's potentially going to be PV PvP mm. conflict in the game because I certainly have played with strangers at conventions who absolutely hate that who've come into a game with something like Hot War and thought oh hang on I, I'm at odds with the other characters I don't <laughs> like this I don't like this at all which, which is fair I mean I'm not criticizing them it's, it's, it's a matter of taste but yeah, you have to be upfront about that, that it's a possibility. But yeah, I personally, I absolutely live for those games where the stakes are complex and uh, enough that yes, you can take different sides and you often do get schisms in the, the group. Uh, you know, people, some people siding with one faction, some people siding with a different one, you know, maybe setting up their own faction. And, uh, you know, just the complex interplays you get there. I, I uh, Personally, I find those the most exciting games to play and, and to GM. I actually find games where you're sort of forced to do or go to the party line more conflicting than ones you're allowed PvP in because you're expected mm. to do something and that can cause more rifts between the players than not because everyone's looking at this one player who doesn't really want to do that one thing but they, they kind of like concede to do that one thing um it can be a little bit awkward yeah. things well you, but but i think you can play with that expectation in quite yeah. fun ways i i mean there's certainly a couple of campaigns i've run uh where you are set up as employees of an organization and you know, you, you, you're, you're given reasons to do things. And then it turns into a sort of RPG equivalent of the Milgram experiment. It's sort of, you know, how much can you ramp up what you're expecting the, the player characters to do before the players turn around and say, hang on, no, 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 burn it all down. That could be employee of the week with that attitude. 
if you've done your job as GM, finding that specificity that we talked about to tie each of the player characters into the scenario with high stakes, those are likely going to be different, right? And so each 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 PC yeah. is motivated by something different, maybe by money, maybe by status, maybe by uh, ethical quandaries, maybe by for political reasons, um, or you know, very personal reasons, and those are likely to be at odds at least sometimes. That's one reason yeah, I like doing scenarios for Alien. Is mm. is part of writing a cinematic mm. scenario is giving everyone a personal agenda, and those are very frequently at odds with what the other players want to do. Yeah, and and similarly, Hot War and Cold City, I think, are particularly good examples of that because it's baked into not just the setting but the mechanics. When you create characters for those games, you have uh, your, your members of factions, and the factions each have their own agendas that are in conflict with each other, but the the characters are also members of a group that is tied together, that has got a task. And then on top of that, each person has got their own, each character has got their own person agenda. And so the person agenda may be at odds with the faction agenda. The faction agenda is almost certainly at odds with what the entire group is trying to do. Um, and so, you know, at that stage, all you really have to do is set up an opening scene and watch the whole thing explode. So, yeah, it, we've talked to, you can't talk about plot hooks without talking about plot, right? Because that's, that's ultimately mm -hmm. the larger context for a plot hook, right? But what do you do when you have, you're at the table and you've presented your plot hooks and suddenly you've got a player who doesn't want to go along with you know, the, their their character's agenda or doesn't want to go along with your agenda or whatever, and uh, and, and you're in the middle of the game. Uh, and it's a little different from flipping, what you were talking about, Chad, flipping a character over to, you know, the dark side or whatever. Um, what if you've got this player who is now resisting, uh, resisting the hook? What do you do with that? Give them a shimp. Uh, basically, is what I do. If I give you an NPC that basically bothers you all the time and gets you into trouble, that's because you've been sitting around a lot. So I, I attach a player that, with an NPC who's just an arsehole and he's just there to annoy you and get you involved in the hook. Um, I literally mailed an NPC to someone in a suitcase from New York to London in masks. Uh, and uh, <laughs> just all these piss bottles like rolling out when he opened up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because this player was he, he was an interesting player um I, I, basically you know like the opening scene where they go up in the hotel and sort of like he refused to engage in the the actual opening scene he wanted to go oh. to the bar and sit and it's like oh okay this is what's happening so that's why he ended up with this this character i also you also like you need to give them make the mundane dramatic basically is, is another thing to do if they want to do something like go to a tailor shop and they just want to shop for the day. Um, one of the mm. things I did to the same player was I turned that uh, tailor shop into um, a, a Russian spy like outpost. Uh, so he said a word and they went, oh, you're, you're our guy, come with us, we need to show you all this stuff. And really sort of like <laughs> pull them into this, this sort of horrendous plot of him being meant to be the spy and they've got it all wrong. And they try to go, no, 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 I'm not anything to do with this. And they're like, just put, take them in the back room where the, all the guns are. And uh, really get him involved. Wasn't so, that a Fry and Laurie sketch? Yes, yes, <laughs> it absolutely was. <laughs> That's excellent. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've I've certainly had my share of players like that over the years, and my reaction to them is variable. I mean, it depends on what they do. Certainly, play players who find other things for their characters to do that don't involve engaging with the hooks. As long as the things they're doing are interesting and drive conflict, I'm just happy to run with them. Um, the, the only times I'm unhappy with it are when you have players who just plain won't engage. And, I mean, uh, some of that you know, may well be down to you as the GM and how you're presenting stuff, in which case you, you need to think about what you're doing and why it's not engaging and talk to the players and find out why that's not the case. But I, I certainly have played with people who 
will sign up for horror games, but then decide they're going to very much play their character like an ordinary person who is frightened at everything, but to the extent where they will spend the entire game hiding under a table or whatever while everyone else engages with what's going on. And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that's not a, um, a, a reasonable reaction for a character in that situation, but it's not a very fun thing to role-play. And you know, as, as I may have said before, th there's a reason why in Call of Cthulhu they're called investigators and not passive observers. Um, <laughs> You know, you, 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 should, you should be investigating. <laughs> uh, but the other kind of, kind of shooting off at, at tangents and not engaging with stuff that can be even more disruptive is when someone just misreads or, or, or willfully misunderstands the hook and the tone of what's going on and, uh, and does... Yeah. And it's a difficult thing to pin down, but takes actions that bring in the wrong kind of conflict, the conflicts that aren't fun, that antagonize the other people at the player, uh, at, at the table. Um, the, the one that always sticks with me uh, is that there was a convention game I ran many years ago. It was a pulp convention, uh, pulp, pulp, um, it wasn't Cthulhu, but a pulp convention game that was set on board a Zeppelin in the 1930s and there was some kind of Nazi plot going on. And uh, the... <laughs> At some point, one of the player characters just decides, actually, I think the Nazis are pretty sympathetic. I'm going to side with them. And it's, everyone was looking at what the fuck? <laughs> no, <Lord>. no. <laughs> oh, no. And, oh. and yeah, that game just, like the Zeppelin, crashed and burned. <laughs> oh. That's very strange that you mentioned Zeppelin, because I thought maybe it was this... <laughs> It could be the same scenario. It's, it is this one's a Pulp Cthulhu scenario, but I know about one where so, a player decided to start throwing grenades in in a Zeppelin combat situation, and it's <laughs> both self destructive and was you know damaging other player characters. And that one was a that's one of the most disruptive tables I've ever heard about. It's funny at both that's in Zeppelins, <laughs> different places. <laughs> Must be the altitude. Right. Yeah, actually, I think it, I, I was going to say sometimes there is a line over which the disruption, you can just sort of feel that it's outside of what's happening in the fiction. And uh, sometimes I think you do, it, it bears having a side conversation. Let's have a break. Let's get, let's get some water. Let's get some snacks. And then just check in with someone who is either intentionally seems to be disruptive or um or is checked out and is under a table sometimes that's what they want sometimes they've had yeah. a bad day and you know or had, woke up you know on the wrong side of the bed or and and just kind of wants to observe for that time it's a bit disruptive to have them at the table but it's also okay if it's okay with everyone else right think okay you could you you are checked out uh, I don't need to, you know, throw things at you under the table if you're enjoying yourself. But it, you might check in and just make sure they're okay and uh, want to continue. And give them an out. Give them, you know, let them off the hook if if they really just don't feel like playing or there's something about the table that they're not they're not jibing with. It's okay to walk away. It has to be. But, but yeah, there definitely, definitely are. So, oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so sorry. I've definitely had that happen in. In convention scenarios before it's it's usually happening because someone's not feeling well and decided to try and push themselves and come to the game anyway because they didn't want to disrupt it by dropping out and, mm. and then and they end up halfway through they had to drop out anyway because they're they're just not well and said so that is that's why i always say at the beginning of my games if you need to leave for any reason please do so just yeah. give people the encouragement that if it's not working out they don't have to keep going and so it's a lot less disrupt disruptive to leave a game you're not engaged in than and then stick around and be a distraction. Mm, 100%. That's one thing um Alien does well. So have you ever taken a, a player off a like a PC off a character? Do they do have rules for it in Alien? I don't think I've done that. And generally generally death doesn't happen till pretty close to the end in my scenarios. Okay. And 
and it's actually far more likely for just random dismemberment. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like it when everyone gets out alive but missing a few limbs. That's <laughs> fair. Yeah, it's, it's got an interesting built-in rule where it says once the player becomes too antagonistic to the group, it's taken off them and they become an NPC, basically. Mm. Uh, it's an interesting oh, thing to nice. actually add to the, the scenario rules. Yeah, I think that um, kind of thing's going to work particularly well in uh, campaign play for Alien. And I've, yeah. I've only done one shot so far. Hmm. But it's not even just off days. I mean, I, I certainly have played with a couple of people over the years who just seem to be allergic to engaging with the premise of the game. Yeah. And I don't know if this is just sheer contrarianism or whether it's some kind of... Maybe you know they, they, they've felt social pressure to play a horror game because that's what everyone else is playing, but they maybe at they, their heart they don't actually enjoy playing horror games. And, and so this is their way of sort of turtling and disengaging from the whole thing. Um, but yeah, I, I, mean, I, I did end up in a few of the scenarios that I wrote a while back, having to come up with the ways, uh, if you read, uh, Bleak Prospect, for example, that I, I, uh, published in Nameless Horrors years back, there are all sorts of little things in there about how to keep the characters involved. And it's because I play tested it with this group in the first place. And it, it, it was just this... With a couple of them, it was this almost antagonistic thing of, well, you have to give us reasons not to run away at this point. You have to give us reasons not to call the police. You have to give us reasons not to just burn down this house that's got the NPC that we're trying to rescue in it. And, uh, yeah, it, it, it got really weird. And so, yeah, I just had to kind of proof the scenario against that, which was probably an overreaction, but... Uh, it's left scars. I, I ended up writing a very sarcastic one-page RPG <laughs> called We Call the Police, which uh, I'll, 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 I'll put a link to somewhere, which is just really about how to engage with that behavior. Well, no, it's not about how to engage with that behavior. It is a cry of existential pain <laughs> in the form yeah. of a one-page RPG. <laughs> So that's an yeah. advantage if you're running Rivers of London because you are the police. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it does make sense. It, I, I think this comes back down to collecting little little motivations along the way to, so it builds to a, a sort of you have to go in or it kind of goes against everything that's gone before. It's the... I guess it's the the, the sort of positive or slower burning scenario you can like give them nuggets uh, far more sort of clearly rather than hit them in the face with one set piece. And then when they come out the other side, they go, well, that was interesting. And then just go back to their normal lives sort of thing, which is something that can happen. Mm. Yeah. I think at a convention, it's difficult to quickly triage what the problem is with a, a player who is not engaged. Mm. Um, when you have, when you know your group, you, you can have a longer process of figuring out what as a player they enjoy. Uh, playing, <laughs> hi kitty. Um, <laughs> what as a player motivates them at the table? If you haven't found it yet, if uh, investigating the uncle's death is is not the kind of hook that they like, that you can quiz them and and give them more yes and at the table for the things that they do like. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if, the, if if that initial hook is not what they want, they shouldn't really be in that scenario. Is is kind of the point? Yeah. I think. Yeah. There's only so, so much you can do. Yeah, yeah. they have to meet you so, halfway at least. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Everybody, please talk about one of your writing projects <laughs> that that would illustrate uh, how you developed plot hooks that work. Especially in in terms of uh, helping players find their own reasons to engage with the premise that you're offering in that, in that scenario. Mm. Well, I could say so, a way that I've cheated and, uh, and I, and I really enjoy is, is the locked room. And I, I did write the boat is sinking <laughs> scenario. So, you know, mm. you're going to do something you're either yeah. going, you know, if you're going to be super passive, that is just a self-destructive act and that's on you. Yeah, you, you can play that. That's absolutely a choice. Um, but 
yeah, I actually really like the house is burning, the ship is sinking, the hurricane is is upon you, whatever it is, um, because it's it's too compelling to to really um, pretend you're not engaged with the stakes too high. Yeah, put them in survival mode, basically. Hmm. Can't do that every time. Yeah. That's, that's why I say cheating because it's it doesn't work for every investigation where you've received a letter. You know. Well, it's a different type of thing. It's like survival. I think is completely like it. You've got cold case. You've got survival. You've got personal trauma. These are the three sort of like big categories. I think most things fall into. Um. Yeah, I like a survival a lot, especially if everything's limited and you have to make like bad choices, basically. Um. Mm. Yeah, uh, but oh gosh, one ones I'm particularly happy with the way they worked out. Again, I mean, yeah, you know, like Chad, I think that um, that that feeling of suddenly having this this exist sudden existential problem to deal with works quite well, and you know, I mean, as I mentioned, Night Bus does that, but. If you're looking at ones where it's it's a more general opening, and one that can bring together a group of disparate characters, uh, the one I'm probably happiest with is one that Graham's played, which is the Meat Trade, uh, where there there is an opening scene in that where I, mean, I won't go into the full details, but. Um, it takes place during the London Blitz in 1941, uh, early 41. And it's a group of uh, characters in the East End who have been dealing with the bombs falling every night for, uh, for, for months and months and have built up their routines. But they're there one day and the bombs have come earlier than usual. And they've had to find a different air raid shelter than their habitual ones. And they've they've gone to one of these new above ground air raid shelters which turned up in later on in the war, which were notorious because they just weren't very safe. But they've had to use one of those just out of sheer desperation. And it's this group of players coming together in this unfamiliar air raid shelter and sitting there as the bombs are dropping and realising that yeah, someone or something in their midst isn't quite what it appears to be and shit goes down. <laughs> and that 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 is a hook I think actually worked really well for bringing the group together. Yeah, that shared experience, that's trauma sort of thing. I guess I would go with uh, La Rosette, which uh, Scott, you have played. Uh, it's the one where mm, you can yeah, media yes. res. Um, you, can, mm. you can thrust most uh, characters in that. You just have to have a, a dead body you want answers from that's in your trunk, and you're basically going mm. to try and figure out uh, how to talk to this dead body. So you've got to go around mm. collecting um, sort of ritual sort of ingredients almost, uh, and then performing the ritual at the end of it, and basically trying to avoid um, suspicion and all the rest of it, and you need a, a, a human sacrifice for it. So you have this sort of moral dilemma: you sort of who do you choose? Uh, it, putting value on different people's lives uh, all the way through the scenario. You don't actually have to, at the end of the day, kill someone. You, uh, the the person who will do the ritual, you will substitute a pig in. But if you do that, uh, the ritual has a lot of chances of going south very, very fast because <laughs> it's not quite as useful. Uh, and that sort of thing. I but listened yeah. to uh, I listened to La Reset on ASN, and uh, the, my my favorite memories are people making fun of Cuppy Cup's varying <laughs> accent throughout the whole thing. Even though he was, you know, he's from Texas, and the when you guys played it, it was in Louisiana. Yeah. So mm. theoretically, he would have heard, you know, enough to pick up on it. But uh, no, that was that was spectacular. <laughs> he was very proud of well, that I accent. Should... <laughs> Well, he he lives in Texas, but he's not a Texan originally, and he he gets very. I mean, he's certainly got quite apologetic about his inability to do a Texan accent before. <laughs> <laughs> so, what else? Uh, what else, do you guys? What what other writing projects of your own uh, have you had had this work well? With? Uh, one of mine that I particularly enjoy running is uh, my cult scenario, Call to Account. I've run that one on Symphony Entertainment, if anyone wants to watch it. 
the premise of that is that you all belong to a, f a web forum uh, devoted to investigating cold cases. So you've got four characters who, uh, on the face of it, mm -hmm. look entirely unconnected. Uh, they're all just members of this forum. Uh, but uh, some of them actually have a very personal interest in the case. Uh, some of them it is more professional initially, but as things unfold, uh, you start to find personal connections. And it it's not it it can be a kind of locked room thing, as there will definitely be points in it where you can't escape the situation. But uh, for, for quite a lot of the scenario, it is just that that strong interest in solving this case is what keeps people in the building. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I played that with you, didn't I? There, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, as a, as a sort of counter example, one Sue mentioned earlier, a scenario I wrote a while back in Fear Sharp Little Needles Unland, was I, I, I think almost the polar opposite of everything I've been talking about because Fear Sharp Little Needles is an odd collection in that the the maximum word count for any of the scenarios was 3,000 words, so you had to be really sparing with what you put in there. And you know, for anyone who's ever written a scenario, you, you know how little you can fit into 3,000 words. And so there were all sorts of compromises I had to make in how I conveyed information there. And a big thing in that was I didn't really have the luxury of putting in much in the way of solid hooks. And there's a little bit where I throw out a, you know, a couple of one-line ideas, but it really then becomes an exercise in creativity for the GM and the group to come up with their own reasons to get involved. And certainly when I've heard about people playing it and come across actual plays online, that actually seems to have ended up working very well because it does mean that it, it 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 inherently becomes tailored to each group because you know there isn't a fixed hook it's just a location and you have to come up with your own, own reason why you go there and i've I've certainly seen some great ones so i mean when we played it with ain slade nobody a cuppy cup came up with a, a character who'd yeah had had two really good reasons for uh, for it, one is that you know set in an abandoned amusement park and he'd worked there as a teenager before it you know, it had all closed down and wanted to go back and, and revisit it because he had some personal history with it. But he was also someone who was obsessed with amusement parks. He ran a, a web forum with it and just wanted to go out and document it. And yeah, that, I mean, neither of those were things that really would have occurred to me. But they, they ended up um, drawing his character in perfectly and, and leading to some really terrible things. Do you think there's a, or do you have personally maybe an easier era to write plot hooks for? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you find it's easier to do modern for you, for yourself, or is it easier to maybe call of Cthulhu classic, or is there something that that uh, that lends itself better to your process? I think the further you go back in time, the more people strive to even just survive and get on with daily life. So. Stakes are higher the further you go back, I think. Um, it's like the hooks become a little bit easier because to lose something, um, say if you're at Old West, for example, it's like I've got a scenario fever where everyone's traveling to um, the, the part of the 49ers traveling to California. They've got everything in a, in one wagon. It's, that's a, that's their whole life, their whole existence is in one wagon. It's like if they lose like just the horse, then they lose the wagon, then they lose everything. So it becomes far more essential for them to succeed. Uh, where modern scenario, you can have that uh, element where everything's on the line, but there are like support networks and stuff like that for getting people off the ground. But back then, there's nothing, absolutely nothing. That is a dilemma with going back in the past and, and writing hooks, uh, is that if your hook depends on historical context, then you've got a barrier to entry rather than uh, you know, something more compelling. It, that, so on the modern side, you have the luxury of people immediately understanding the environment and, and why they might yeah. be motivated, whereas um, even in the 20s, you, 
you have to explain the context too much for your hook, you might revise. Um, you can always bring in context throughout the scenario. I, I think if you have to teach how things are, I mean, I guess I think of uh, Brett Kramer's machine tractor station. Oh no, I forget, is it 37? <laughs> 47, um, I think. But, you know, 47. Probably right over here. But. Yeah. Is it? Uh, anyway. Yes. That, I, that could, one, I yes. could Google, but anyway, that one. Um, you know, that requires some some historical context because the characters mm. are at odds with each other. They are from, you know, some are from the party and some are from, uh, you know, local... Uh, local factions and whatnot, and so you do sort of have to have a basis of knowledge there. But you can also be pretty quick and um, and just say this is what you want. Um, but anyway, they, so the further back you go, the more you might have to provide a little context to help with the entry points. Hmm. And. Um I think there's also an emotional distance when you're dealing with stuff that happened in the past that you don't necessarily get in the present day. Where if if you're if you have a modern scenario, the character the, the players can probably empathize, empathize with the characters in this situation a lot more immediately, and it might feel more real to them. But if you're playing, say, something about gangsters in the 1920s, their connection with it is going to be entirely through media, and as a result, the it's is um, going to feel detached straight off. It's going to feel like a story. It's going to be easier to lean into tropes. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It can be a very fun experience. But it does it, it does perhaps make it a bit more difficult to make it uh, kind of personal and emotionally connecting. All right, so um, a lot of people are talking about artificial intelligence and large language models and things like that. And there's a, there's there's debate over the utility and what the appropriate use uh, of these tools. Um, and there's plot hook generators. I don't know if you guys have, have mm -hmm. researched this, but there are AI plot hook generators. Um, a lot of YouTubers are using them. Um, and, you know, even before that, you know, the, there were random plot tables in in books, you know, D and D. the The infamous Dungeon Master's Guide of A D and D was mostly tables, random table generation. Mm -hmm. um, so this, you know, the kind of a, a, a continuum of all that. Um, do you use any of these? Uh, and what would be your advice, maybe for a new GM who is trying to sort out what to do about all of these options? For plot hooks, I'm for using everything you possibly can get your hands on as far as what to do at the table as GM. Uh, use the AI if you want to use ChatGPT to play with ideas. I don't think that's a crime. Don't pull text and try to publish that. <laughs> that's that's where the line should be drawn. But um, but I don't think uh, I don't think as a tool for idea generation that it, it's it's so bad. I also don't think it's all that new. Like you mentioned, tables have been around forever, and uh, there was this book Plato uh, for oh, yes. pulp writing. Yes. Yeah, Plato, the master book of all plots. With uh, I looked it up, William Wallace Cook. Um, that has it's for writing, but you know um, this is before role playing games. Anyway. Um, so I think you use all of that. Whatever's comfortable, whatever helps you generate ideas is great. Um, and then, and just pay attention as a, we're talking about GMs doing this, uh, pay attention to what motivates you at the table because most GMs are first players. Um, take notes when you feel compelled by a plot hook that somebody else is, is running you through and figure out what types of plot hooks you respond to because they're probably the ones that you're uh, most able to render well at the table. And I think you're all going to get better results if you're using a, a random table that was specifically written for that game. 
because the, uh, yeah. whoever wrote that knew what they were doing and chat gpt doesn't so i've got yeah. an entire cult scenario that I, I just run using the cult tarot deck which is basically one massive random table mm -hmm. uh, i just spend the whole session drawing cards and pulling ideas off them mm. but yeah that that deck it's not a standard tarot deck it's specifically tailored to cult and its cosmology so yeah i think you're going to get better results with that than a, i would with a large language model Yeah, I agree 100%. I I have played with AI tools and I they I it's not that they're terrible, uh, but my experience of them is that the stuff that they come out with tends to be very tried and obvious. Yeah. And because you know it is just fundamentally remixing other things that people have written and so you know you're not going to see anything desperately original coming out of that. Random tables I think are quite interesting. Because you don't necessarily have to use them as they're written. Um, for a start, quite often I just look at a list of random tables and rather than rolling for something, I, I just look at the item that appeals to me most and think of that one because, you know, why the hell should I roll a die and hope that I get the one I want when I can just say, you know, that, yeah, that one. And, and, I mean, it's kind of like that thing of, you know, making a decision by flipping a coin because, you know, once the coin's in the air, you know what it is you actually want. So you, you're not beholden to the result of the, the thing that comes down. But, but, I mean, it's having those external sources of, inf of, of um, inspiration is absolutely fantastic. Uh, very different from what Sue was talking about there, but... Um, I've, I've run a lot of completely improv games on Ain't Slayed Nobody uh, over the course of the last few years. And what we tend to do there is go out to the backers and say, oh, you know, give us a suggestion. You know, here are like five categories of questions. Give us some suggestions. And we won't use all of them, but um, what will happen is we'll either look at some of them in advance and use them to generate characters in the situation, or some of them, you know, will save for play and just sort of think, oh, yeah, uh, um, I'm stuck for an idea now. Let's choose this random element here and see what this does to the game. And my experience of doing that has really worked very well. So, yeah, you know, those... Those sort of random sources of information as hooks, as long as you interpret them, as long as you make them your own and don't just read out what's there, yeah, it could be fantastic. Yeah, it's definitely a tool to to look at, but you say it's very generic. Uh, what comes out of these things, um, and they tend to lie as well. And there's a f famous case that came out a couple of months mm -hmm. ago. Was like some lawyer used it to oh, yes. uh, use, and the the case they cited was fictional just made it up on the, on the spot um it's interesting how it's actually evolving to, to lie more and more to be yeah i don't know but yeah i mean you live on a planet with what seven billion apex predators that you're always like online perpetually with it's like everyone has a story everyone's doing things for motives it's like read the paper um look at biographies look that it's like these new um sort of ais are nothing compared to just the vast like quantity of human people on the planet who are all just as intelligent as you going about their day it's just another one basically it's uh, very accessible and um, so look at people's stories look at people's biographies look at interesting cases um that come up in in trials and so forth and um look at that sort of personal hooks that, why are these people invested in these situations and maybe you can find something that interests you and then you take that and you smash it together with like a, a interesting setting or an interesting um, plot line you've been having. It's like the best ideas, the best um, scenarios and hooks always come from several ideas being fused together uh, rather than one singular idea, which will get you only so far. So, yeah, it's interesting how you know, there, there's this tension between sort of the personal and the general that. You know, it sounds like you guys have been saying is that to have a good plot hook, it needs to be intensely personal, at least for the the player characters, uh, if not for the players themselves. It needs to be intensely personal, but at the same time, you have to generalize that. You have to bring it out into the open so that it can engage with the real world of the scenario, because that's a much more diffuse, um, diffuse situation than the internal life of the PC. 
and that tension is is where uh, I think the interest in all, all all the work has to go in. Hmm. Um. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh... <laughs> it was my turn for Scott to disagree with. <laughs> <laughs> He's disagreed with everyone else. It was my turn now. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's. <laughs> I'm a very disagreeable person. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it depends. I, I, I may have misunderstood your your premise there, but I, I I think in terms of you don't you don't always have to think of the generic at all in terms of of hooks. So much of it depends on. <laughs> How you're presenting this, how you're running it, a scenario, how um, the, the whether it's something that's for publication, something that's for a general audience, or something that is tailored to a particular group of players, a, a particular group of characters, which you can do with the convention game as well. So you can make it all in, you know, intensely personal to the characters without any thought to the generic. But that's something you probably can't do too well uh, in a published piece of work because unless you're providing pre-generated characters for it, which, you know, I mean, that's exactly what we did in Nameless Horrors. But um, unless you're providing pre-generated characters, it's it's got to be at least slightly generic. Otherwise, there's going to be no way in for uh, for most groups. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. What I was talking about was that that idea of the published scenario. Um, that at some point it's got to be released out into the wild, and yeah, and yeah, you know, at one point, are you do you do you realize that these plot hooks that you're writing are in fact you're you're in fact writing a movie script? You know that you have this really contained world, um, and 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 you have to break those boundaries because otherwise you don't have a game anymore. You have a different kind of of experience. A different set of roles and a different set of expectations. So those boundaries and that tension um, between the two, I think, is where is 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 to me the most interesting part. Negotiating all of that. Well, I I I mean I don't think starting off with a strong premise that that has characters that are tailored to it necessarily stop something feeling like a game um what's important is the choices the players make once they with those characters once they engage with that premise and that's what stops it feeling scripted that's what stops it feeling like a railroad or a passive experience of of consuming media so i i don't think that's in any way changed or negated by having a very strong tailored premise um and right, I, I agree. I, don't, I think I don't, I'm, I'm talking more yeah. about the uh, how how much constraint those plot hooks can put on the entire um, the entire scenario. You know what I'm saying? It's not just the premise; yeah. it's the entire scenario. How how uh, how tight a constraint set of constraints are you putting in? Um, but go ahead. I, I don't think it does because no. because you can change the hook at any point by introducing a new factor or a new vector into any story, mm. uh, and really taking it on uh, in a different direction. It's like um, I've got a, it doesn't always work. I mean, twists are a very hard thing to pull off properly because people are there for the initial premise, and if you promise them a, a sort of like a day on the beach, and they're they're thrown through a, a mangler and uh, over the other side, sometimes that's not what they they're going to enjoy that. Um, but I've got a scenario called uh, the Great Healer, which is like you're there to prove that ghosts are real. It's like I, I, someone was dragged off a boat by a, a ghost boy, uh, and the, the media it's a big, massive media storm, and there's, there's like lawyers involved, a big case about this kid, and you basically are playing charlatans trying to prove for this <laughs> lawsuit that uh, ghosts exist. Um, so you go on the on the sort of the horrid history tour in Boston Harbor, and you're taken along, and eventually you will come across like. This situation where you find the boy and the boy is actually a ghost uh but it's, it's like an echo of the past and it's like a gateway to another time so you're time traveled into the past and you end mm. up on the orpheus which is a, a listless sort of like merchant vessel in the middle of the atlantic but it's one of its cargo is this dead body of this woman who died uh, basically in her last um sort of like acts of vengeance was to 
do this spell, which gets up echoed through times and pulls people through time, but it's via these these uh, ghosts to save her. Um, and you basically go through instances of her life, uh, sort of thing, uh, to do that. And I had a few players who went, "Oh, I, I didn't want to do this sort of story. I wanted to do the the ghost story where you were in the harbor and all that sort of thing." So it's it's very mm -hmm. sometimes you can really yeah. get the players heckles up by doing that. Yeah, it's interesting. So, so you 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 start out with your your initial plot hook, and you've got the players have bought into it and all that. Do you, and if so, how introduce uh, adjustments through other plot hooks, or or can you help maybe offer advice to a an inexperienced GM about how to correct course through the use of plot hooks? Uh, what do you typically do with that? I think it's good to have an NPC on hand that is either a, a parallel investigator or um, you know an interested party who can intervene if if the if you need course correction uh, that can come and introduce new information or um, yeah or set set the investigators back on the path. That's sort of a, a ripcord, a, a last maybe last resort, but sometimes you get there um, in your first 10 minutes if you realize that the you haven't provided enough of a hook or the players at the table aren't specifically responding, then maybe bring in a, a, new, a new character, but have them on hand so you don't have to improvise a completely new person um, and introduce new information. And one of the things that I think is, does help is to bring the weird. You know, if you haven't brought the weird early enough, uh, or if it wasn't weird, as weird as you thought it was, the hook, you know, the evidence in, uh, in the beginning, introduce something weirder that indicates uh, there's something really worth your curiosity, as players at least. Mm. Well, also, I, a lot of it depends on what you mean by plot hooks. And and th th this is where it sometimes becomes a bit difficult for me to think of it in these terms, because I don't often think of games that I'm running in terms of plots. So, I mean, the hooks, you know, uh, uh, for me, are ways of creating interesting situations and interesting conflicts in the game. Things for the players and their characters to actively get involved with and to try to come up with an interesting resolution to it all. And so when I'm thinking of bringing in hooks during the course of a game that will keep things moving, I, I don't necessarily think of it. I mean, sometimes it is, yes, getting information into the hands of the, the, the characters so that they've got some idea of something interesting they might be able to do next. But more often than not, what I'm thinking of is how can I bring more conflict into this? Because conflict is what's interesting. Interesting. And so sometimes, I mean, that can be an antagonistic NPC that just comes in and livens things up. It can be some kind of disaster that happens, some setback to the plans. But, you know, it, it's, it's that feeling of when something needs to happen. It's almost like the classic Raymond Chandler thing of, you know, if, if the plot's slowing down, just have two guys with guns walk into the room. And, I mean, it doesn't have to be something as obvious as that, but it's sort of, oh, hang on, here's a problem that we've got to deal with that's somehow related to what we've been dealing with. Um, what are we going to do about that? And that will keep the energy of the game going and that for me is the most important thing yeah i'm going to go back to alien actually because it does something very different uh, as a, I, I i like alien a lot for some some reasons it's like the way it presents games is it gives you three act structure and within them three act structure it gives you events uh that you could throw at the player mm -hmm. and i i feel like they're just some of them are new hooks like it's, they have mandatory and like like um optional choices for each of these things and the mandatory ones tend to be the ones which will reinvest the players into the direction it's it's great to put conflict and muddle the, the story with that sort of thing um but they can tend to take them away from the plot. I, that is fine because it's not a story, really. You're not really telling a story. You're having experience on a table where the players are, are having their own little stories within them themselves, and they can ignore mm -hmm. the plot if they want. 
Uh, but if you want to get into the end of the, the that plot, the, the scenario wants, like you, if you want to push them to that finale, basically, if you want them to stay on on track, you can have these sort of like indicators that will push them back to that direction by um, forcing a, a situation which they have to react to again. Like for example, mm-hmm. in, there's one uh, Heart of Darkness um, does this a lot. You're on this this sort of space uh, space station which is solely been eaten by a black hole and certain like like factions will show up at some points and it'll it, it requires your attention basically to to take you back into that story yeah i've played yeah. that one and uh it's that's a great scenario yeah it, it, that kind of reminds me a bit of um ron edwards wrote a game called sorcerer back in the late 90s which was a phenomenally influential game at you I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say it changed the face of gaming. And it certainly influenced me an awful lot. And there are two things he talked about in that which very much tie in with with all this, which are uh, kickers and bangs. Uh, so kickers are the personal plot hooks that characters have that get them involved with the situation, give them reasons to do things. An open-ended mystery that they're trying to solve that is related to their character. But bangs... Uh, really what we're talking about here to a large extent bangs are these things that the gm throws in which are like many plot hooks i guess except they're not plot related the idea of a bang is it is this problem or situation that you're throwing into the game that the the player characters have got no choice but to address but is completely open-ended that you're as a gm when you're throwing a bang into a game you're coming up with a problem that you personally have no solution for and that's always how i look at things in games you know as a as a gm it's my job to come up with the problems is the players jobs to come up with the solutions if as as a scenario writer or as a gm i've come up with what the solution is ahead of time I, 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 I'm not happy with that. I, 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 as a GM, I play to see what happens. I, I want to see what the players are going to do with this shit storm they're in. Yeah, Scott, uh, preparing for this, I was thinking about Fairyland, which I've run a number of times uh, for Cthulhu Dark. And, and actually, the plot hook of that is um, you're there. Correct me if I'm wrong, because I've run it a few mm. times and maybe I've drifted, right? But I think it's that you're there to sort of look into an ancestral property that you might be moving to, or that you have. Oh, you have moved there. I think you maybe mm, drawn. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, so so you're there. That's the plot hook. Is that mm. that you've already invested in this community? Um, you haven't just wandered in, and then it feels like. Uh, what you were just talking about is this, there's a, just a number of bangs that get you involved because the plot is you live here. <laughs> you know, the plot yeah. hook is the, you live here. Um, and then it becomes a sort of Twin Peaksian uh, series of encounters with weird stuff. And, um, and it's wide open. It's completely player driven as to which direction that they go. Um, but what you've done is provide this huge toolbox of ways to get players to have players react and to have players chase their curiosity. And you have a number of different things that you can do. If if one thing doesn't work, you've got at least you know three other things that that can happen. Um, so the whole thing is a series of plot hooks in that way, mm, just like yeah. you were talking about. Yeah. Yeah, that's very much how I think of, of scenarios. Yeah, I, th- I think of them as a, a situation and a series of problems rather than a plot. If I recall correctly, I listened to that on ASN uh, as well. If I recall correctly, basically everybody went into the forest like right off the bat. <laughs> yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> I haven't yeah. had that. That's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that got interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I want. It's, I'm sorry that I haven't seen that. So, what happens when that happens? Because that's sort of a sort of skip to the end immediately. Do you then? Oh no, no. I, I mean, I, I just threw some of the weirdness at them at that stage, a, a few of the problems, but still, I, 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 I kept my powder dry and kept some of the big bangs for later, and you know, wait. wait, wait. 
they d they didn't stay in the forest. They came back yeah. out again and dealt with the consequences of that, and then and stuff got very weird. Oh, that's cool. So it's almost foreshadowing in that way, accidentally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So uh, got a few. We've got about what fifteen minutes left. A little, little less than twenty minutes left on this. So why don't we do a few uh, a few round robin questions? Um, so let's see. Um, what would you say in your mind is the best resource for GMs who want to dive in deeper to find good plot hooks? Well, the two obvious ones, as far as I'm concerned, are one, just read other published scenarios, see what other people have done. Um, because, you know, the role playing games have been around for 50 years at this stage. The kind of investigative games we're talking about with Call of Cthulhu have been around for at least 40. And there have been a lot of scenarios published in that time. And some of those, yeah, you know, particularly in the early days, some of those hooks are pretty generic and uninspiring. But there have been a lot of very creative people writing scenarios over that time. You know, th thousands and thousands of them published, and many of them will do things that you just do not expect. And you don't necessarily have to use them as written, but just see what other people have done and take inspiration from that. I, and, and the other thing is, I mean, just consume media, read books, watch films, watch television programs, and see the different ways in which uh, characters are drawn into situations. It, it's funny, I was watching, uh, I hadn't seen it for like 25 years, but I watched uh, Farscape recently, <laughs> um, the science fiction series from the late 90s, early 2000s. And... I'd forgotten the sheer economy of the writing in that. The, it sets up the entire premise and gets the characters involved in this very weird situation within like 20 minutes of writing uh, in the first episode. It really sets that up well. And it's a masterclass in that. But also in each of the subsequent episodes, the the, the sheer efficiency with which they set up a premise, or, or sometimes a very weird premise, and get the characters involved with that is just breathtaking. And and honestly, if you're looking for inspiration for for hooks, yeah, watch Farscape. So the recommendation I've seen if you're looking for a plot hook is to pick a random episode of the X Files. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Everyone seems to be on an X File like bent recently because they're re relaunching, aren't they? No, oh, yeah, are? I think so. Yeah, Ryan Coogler, yeah, is doing it. Yeah, and so I wouldn't discount uh, uh, children's media either. There is some very strange stuff out there, uh, apparently written for children, which is nevertheless absolutely terrifying. And well, if, if you're looking for the, right. yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> if you're looking like British folklore, I mean, the, the, yeah. the TV I watched back in the eighties and and the books it was based on, people like Alan Garner, uh, there is. Yeah. Uh, a wealth of plot hooks in there. Not even, not even that. Bluey keeps keep coming up in conversation everywhere. Everyone loves Bluey. <laughs> yeah, yeah there, I mean, there's been so many conversations I've been in online about Bluey that Bluey is now showing up in my Spotify feed. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I don't have children. I'm not going to have children. I, I should I watch this anyway? <laughs> Apparently so. It's all about characters and stuff. Like, yeah, probably. Um, I, I've watched a couple of episodes. It's pretty interesting. Um, I would say for this, understand people, like learn how people work and how to develop characters, and you you get plot hooks from people um, sort of desperate situations and stuff like that. It's like if you understand what drives people um, forward, it's always like them that are going to get into the story and become the the sort of like main sort of focus of these things. So it's like. If you like, um, yeah, I'd say read biographies and all these sort of things. See the interesting people and interesting stories, and like surprisingly, like, like rare events can uh, sort of 
get your imagination going and, and really sort of uh yeah take you in different directions uh diversify your reading a lot basically don't stick in your own little circle um just pick up books uh, and see what what sort of you can get from it uh, it doesn't really matter what it is but uh you can take anything away from a, a random piece of literature even if you hate it in fact bad literature tends to be something you should probably do i think it was uh, stephen king goes uh talking about good trash and bad trash sort of thing um mm -hmm uh yeah it's like you gotta read both because so you you know what's bad and what's good and and also yeah, i could do better than that is a strong motivator for writing something absolutely is yeah definitely or make that specific thing better right yeah yeah improve upon that idea that's what i was going to say is that you, it, it's not so much a resource but a methodology that you look at what you like in media and be, start to become conscious of what a plot hook is in in literature. It's the inciting incident, and you know the same in uh, film and uh, the sort of linear narratives. Look at what you like, um, and go and take notes. Go back and take notes. But what what was the hook? Sometimes you might find that the hook wasn't as was wasn't the thing you noticed. And it might not be the most compelling thing. It might be, you know, the second act that really drew you in. Um, but if you start to pay attention to what you like, because we don't always notice plot hooks, and we don't necessarily remember them by the end of a novel or, or whatever it is. Mm. Um, so study yourself. Yeah, one thing I, I uh, often recommend people do, and I don't, think anyone has done it yet, but uh, I urge them to do it, is to uh, download and study the script of The Wizard of Oz, um, which sounds mm. ridiculous, but it is a very tightly constructed screenplay, mm. um, really beautifully constructed. Um, and uh, the way that it layers plot hooks and inciting incidents, especially in that opening scene, the, the black and white, that opening black and white scenario, um, is really masterfully done, and I think the the uh, the fact that it is seamless, that it is not apparent, that none of that stuff is clear, it doesn't jump up mm -hmm. to the audience that oh here's the inciting incident. Well, yeah, it's the tornado, but it's actually a whole bunch of other stuff. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. that there's a lot of lessons to be learned. Uh, do any of you guys use screenplays or anything like that? Yeah, I read a lot of screenplays these days, and uh, yeah, you're right with um, that. It's, it's got nested uh, sort of problems that always go uh, in sort of an order and they're they're even resolved in, in the, the reverse order to bring you okay. straight back out as well it's like a, a journey and it's almost like a, a rhythm it's an it's an story. onion yeah it's yeah. an onion construction yeah uh-huh yeah so mm -hmm. yeah reading screenplays is, is very interesting but uh yeah you can get a lot from just watching the, the media as well it's like if you really want to to bed down on it there, there's a lot of information out there for people who like YouTube is great for seeing how people deconstruct these things. I think that's probably more useful than reading the, the screenplay themselves because you, you need to know what's mm -hmm. happening uh, and sort of learn why they're doing things in screenplays and stuff like that. Uh, because they're, again, their screenplay is much like a scenario. It's, it's a tool for mm -hmm. the director to go and use and make his own. So it's like I've heard of a lot of um, directors hate absolutely despise when a writer will put um a, a sort of like camera angle in into the <laughs> into the scene because how dare they like detect like dictate a camera angle to me it's my story now and it's not yours like they, they sort of go off on their own do so um but when you look at someone like um oh, i can't remember the director's name uh there's some if directors are writing for themselves to direct there'll be a lot more nuanced and a lot more sort of detailed basically uh, and how mm. to do it, and they'll add these things. Oh, Edgar, uh, Edgar Wright, he always does it. Oh, yeah. uh, he he will put in uh, a, like almost storyboards the whole thing um, himself, so he knows camera angles and all that sort of thing. Because he's writing for himself, it doesn't matter. No one's going to come around and go harumph basically to him. Um, but yeah, so I'd say learn why things happen in screenplays, and then go read screenplays with your sort of like you know a bit about them. Uh I, 
I don't think you necessarily have to do that either, because obviously different people's minds work different ways. And if you're of a very analytical bent, then that approach is probably going to work for you. But I, I think a lot of people also work much more intuitively. And as long as you, as we've talked about, absorb lots of different kinds of media and stories and so on, and internalize how that works, you can probably do a lot of that subconsciously as well. Yeah, I mean, definitely, but I always find it's like it's interesting just to, it's like writing, it's like being shown something and then writing it down. Well, as soon as you write it down yourself, you start to understand it more. You sort of break it down more, sort of thing. That's just how I work, I suppose. I was going to mention a, a, a source that you have to be careful about, but is is a workable uh, inspiration is true crime. You have to be careful not to emulate real details that are grim for somebody's family. Um, but um, but they are investigations. Uh, they do present some interesting kinds of evidence. I would suggest twisting what you find and and providing some remove if you find some compelling evidence. But sometimes compelling evidence can be a great plot hook. Um, or a second hook to draw in, um, draw in your players. And also, it's not just the evidence itself, but uh, true crime storytelling is interesting to look at. So podcasts, for example, um, like the Serial series that has several seasons, um, pay attention to the way those un are unfolded um, to look for plot hooks, um, because those are storytellers who are practiced in presenting evidence and drawing in the listener. Yeah, I'd also say it, don't worry too much about things being troped. Uh, people like tropes a lot. There's a lot of people who go after tropes, like they'll seek them out and stuff like that. And if you look at something like True Detective, like the first season, it's basically just a cop movie. It's just a buddy movie. It's like there's nothing special about True Detective season one, other than it's fantastically written. Um, that's you know, everything that's... that's special about it is sort of removed from the the procedural aspects, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like if you just if you put down on paper what it is and just blatantly say it's two guys in a car are are going after a generic cult, uh, which is not really a cult. Uh. It's just you know it's just a abuse ring basically, and everyone goes, oh, okay, I'm not watching that. I've seen it before. Uh, yeah, yeah. E execution is always much more important than the basic idea, always. Yeah. So, uh, what would be then? We've talked about a lot of common territory. What might be your most uncommon recommendations about plot hooks to any GM, any level of experience? I had a thing that I, I'm not sure that it falls really falls under this question, but a, a process that I do um, editing, especially editing journalism, but now uh, you know editing scenarios as well. That it's just a little magic trick, and I almost hate to give it away because now someone you know edited by me will know what I'm doing. But you can, on a first draft, you can often read through this draft and what we do as writers is we sometimes we feel like we have to scaffold details all the way up to the thing that we thought was cool provide all mm -hmm. this backstory for you know a body that was found with orange orange juice instead of blood or whatever the the, the weirdness is and that uh that was a florida man pull. we found <laughs> florida man yeah <laughs> well, at least we know he didn't die I've <laughs> that's a that's a great scenario title florida man um but anyway that uh you can um you can look sometimes three four paragraphs down in your first draft and find the real first paragraph or the second page um it's the fifth page because you've had to build this entire world. You know, in the beginning there was light, and the, you know we often do that because we got to get to the moment that was probably the real idea that we had on the bus on the way home, or or you know the the thing, the kernel that was the hook for us for our own idea. We sometimes bury the lead, and so that's a trick. Uh, is to yeah, when I 
when I taught writing uh, at the university level, I, there were many, many student papers I would go through and X out like the first two or three because I had found where the essay actually started. Exactly. Okay. This is start with rewrite. This is start with this is your first paragraph. And uh, and yeah, I would they, say they, they let, hated me, but you know, right. Actually, and I would they, say they let yourself. Me, but... Yeah, let yourself do that. Let yourself mm -hmm. let scaffold as much as you want on the first draft. You know, fire your editor. They say right, and just uh, let it fly. But then be aware on your revision and do do a revision before you present the material. <laughs> um, that you've probably buried it because you had to warm up for quite some time and. A lot of the warm up is often dry. But I'd say also that RPG scenarios are a bit unusual in that respect, in that uh, that may be a structural thing, but some of that stuff that you're cutting out in the first few paragraphs, if it is backstory and setting and you know, the explanation of how you got there, that may still prove to be useful information for the GM. I, it's something I struggle with sometimes when I'm thinking about what to actually. The, the um, GM was too much information, but at the same time, if you do give them some backstory that may not come into play, it still gives them context for, uh, that may help them with presenting some of those details. And it may also, if the GM improvises a lot around it, give them stuff they can draw on that will come into play that may not be in the scenario, but you know, it gives them the tools they need for that improvisation. So, yeah, I, I agree that, yeah, that, that structure, particularly in the story in an article, is important. But, yeah, I don't, I don't think, you know, don't, don't get rid of all of your, your backstory. No, and actually I wouldn't say get rid of it. I would, would just say sometimes in the, say in the introduction, which is often a, in scenarios and Call of Cthulhu scenarios, is your pitch to GMs. Like, yeah, here's, yeah. here's the thing you might want to do. It, make sure that you put the weird stuff pretty high there. And then again, in your investigator information, uh, make sure that the hook is what we're talking about. Make sure that the, the hook has something that you haven't maybe buried, you know, down below about, about the situation. And then for also for what's really going on, make sure that you hit that hard and don't, you know, and don't necessarily provide all the context before you say what's really going, you know, in a sentence, what's really going on is uh, the Migo are in town, you know, <laughs> let, let uh, be clear uh, up front. I've actually got a scenario that you could read that, sh that does that by mistake in Crooked and Cracked Man's to bury the lead very, very hard. Uh, oh like yeah, the fifth, the fifth page. It's like I, I was like looking to what the hell is going on <laughs> in this thing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's it, it is there. You just have to to dig it out. Um, yeah, uh, I, I would say um, don't conflate uh, set pieces with your hooks. It's like you've had a big mm -hmm. bombastic start. You still have to come out with the other side with some sort of motive to move forward, or they're just going to wander off back to their normal lives. Uh, you see a lot of scenarios that want that bombastic, like bang, as you were calling them, uh, start and really sort of like hit the players in the face. But you need some substance under it to to get them running forward. Uh, at the sort of like when you get out of that and pace your scenario, don't hit them with like big event after big event after big event. Like just keep on throwing stuff at them. They have to have downtime just to think and collect themselves and really sort of plod forward. In their own pace and find their way into the next big fuck up, basically. Planning episodes, Graham. Planning episodes. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had a planning episode in my life. Uh, I can say that I I do think letters are a fun way of doing plot hooks. That they, they just need to not be cliched. That said, my favourite letter as a plot hook that I've written myself is. Is one where the the premise is a, a dead body has been found in a river, and the the PCs get a letter from the river itself, written oh. on a leaf. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, I like that. <laughs> yeah, so it just a duck shows up with a large leaf that has got scratched on it. Body in me. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, great. <laughs> That's very, very Studio Ghibli. <laughs> Uh, all right well we are we yeah. are pretty close to ending time any any postscripts anything anybody wants to add before we close 
Yeah, I mean, the the one bit of advice I'll always go back to is get your players to do some of this because it's all very well you as the GM trying to come up with reasons why the characters and probably more importantly, the players should care about what's going on enough to engage with it. But no one is going to have a better idea of what's going to make them care than the players. And so if if you've got a basic situation, uh, a problem that's, that's you know, that, that, that's at the core of this scenario, yeah, don't be afraid to go to the players and sort of say, well, why should you get involved with this? What, what, what have your... Why will your characters want to want to investigate? Why will they want to put their lives on the line? Why will they want to have to engage with some really terrifying stuff and not run away? And you know, if the players can make themselves buy into that, that's most of your work done for you. I'd like to build on that and say to give advice to listen intently to your players and what they're mm -hmm. telling you, because they will tell you what they are motivated by. Um, and you can you can build on that as players and the characters themselves. If you are listening to the way that they are interacting with the world, you can pull those things out and then ask leading questions to to gather more details. Yeah, I think it's always good to ask a player what's their character's true beliefs about the world. Uh, oh yeah, what is their what's the lie they tell themselves to get through the day, sort of thing. <laughs> and these two will sort of drive the player. A lot to think about it, but Assassin's Zero is there for a reason. Um, use it wisely. And say so if you're in a campaign, there's no reason you can't repeat that every week. Let's say one of the things in Cult Divinity Lost is dramatic hooks. So at the end of the session, each player is supposed to have two things that they're hoping to achieve in the next session, and that's very handy for. They've basically written the plot hook for you, and then you can just go and figure out what's happening based on that. That's cool. <laughs> oh, Great yeah. Idea. Time Adventures did something very uh, similar, which I loved, which is you finish off every session with you're, you're playing each session like it's an episode of a TV program, and at <laughs> the end of it, you have next week on, and everyone nice. just narrates a little <laughs> image that's going to appear in the next game. Nice. Well, thank you, everyone. That concludes our panel on plot hooks. Many thanks to our panelists for their ideas and advice. And thanks once again to the good friends of Jackson Elias for hosting this weekend's event. Visit blasphemoustomes.com for more information. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.